from York, Juggler 66, Hour of the Truths, uh, and again in collaboration with my wonderful brother in Christ in the United States of America, who you well know in the meantime from Inquisition Update, Tom Fress. Welcome to the broadcast, Tom. Hello, Jörg, and listeners, nice to be here. I'm so much looking forward to do the 13th reading of our proving by the New Testament that Jesus Christ was the perfect and only, let's say, <laughs> the perfect yeah. and only and complete fulfillment of Daniel 70 years week 2000 years ago. Because the futurists teach, of course, that there will be another 70 years week, but there's only once a fulfillment of that, and that's Jesus Christ. He did it once and for all. And he sure. said so in his own words. When he was dying on the cross, he said, It is finished. And a lot of the things that are finished, we read already in Hebrews chapter 10. This is where we're going to continue today. We finished off last time in our reading here in verse 16 of Hebrews chapter 10, which reads, This is the covenant that I will make with them. And we were referring, of, to, of course, to Daniel chapter 9, verse 27, where it says that he will confirm a covenant with many. After those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws into their heart, and in their minds will I write them. And their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. No, because he brought an end to iniquities. Right, Tom? That's right. He brought an end of sin. He made reconciliation for iniquity. There's no need to remember our sins if they have been forgiven and forgotten. And that's what he did on the cross. He made reconciliation. There's no more outstanding debt uh, between man and God. And Christ bore all of that iniquity on his body. And uh, it all perished with his flesh. And atonement was made as if the lamb was slain. And... Uh, That's where they reside today, forgiven, cast as far as the east is from the west. And so uh, we never stand uh, to be adjudicated for sin ever again. Reconciliation, restitution, and uh, conciliation has been made. Reconciliation with God the Father. 
And the law has been satisfied perfectly and completely by Christ. Never a jot or tittle did he violate of the law. And uh, now we are in him, and as though we had never sinned. And that's what the world finds so difficult to believe. But that's our salvation, belief that Christ fulfilled the law and then bore upon his body our sins and made reconciliation. And uh, to uh, remember our sins is to mock what he did or to deny what he did or to call Christ a liar. And, uh, and to further, uh, to make further sacrifices and oblations is uh, the perfect way to deny that Jesus bore our sins. Yeah, that's why we read in verse 18, huh? Now, where yes. remission of these is, there is no more offering for sin. There's so, no more so sacrifice there is, for sin. That's, that's the point of uh, uh, taking away of the point of the Roman Catholic Church's Mass, which that's is exactly right. Which is just a sacrifice, uh, the Eucharist, which is another sacrifice for sin, because that's there's exactly no other need to make sin uh, to make offerings anyway, huh? just to that's make that's sin go away. And, uh, and this is why Jesus said, "It is finished." Okay. And, uh, and this is also why Daniel said that he would make reconciliation for iniquity, bring in everlasting righteousness, and uh, uh, cause the sacrifices and oblations to cease. Once, once reconciliation has been made, Uh, there's no more need for sacrifice. And it plainly states in verse 18, uh, for our perfect understanding, he said, now where remission of these, that is our sins, where remission of these is, there is no more offering for sin. There's no more lamb. There's no more oblation. Okay? Okay. We don't pray for forgiveness of sin when we already have it, much less make another sacrifice, as do the Roman Catholics and the, and, and, uh, and the Hebrews, the Jews, uh, seeking to build a temple and begin animal sacrifices again with a reestablished uh, priesthood. And uh, you hear all this talk about the building of a temple and the, re and the, the making of new temple utensils and things to continue what they left off doing in the midst of the week, the midst of the 70th and final week when Jesus did it all, when Jesus paid it all. And uh, be, having rejected him, having rejected Christ, they had nothing else to do but to reestablish Temple Mount worship. That was their only remission of sin was to sacrifice animals. And uh, that's why there's still a clamor for the, the, uh, the establishment of a modern nation state of Israel, number one, and then Jews living in the land. They have, to, they have to be in the land in order to build a temple to reestablish the, the uh, I almost said the Roman Catholic priesthood, but that's exactly what they are, priesthood to make sacrifice just like the Roman Catholic priests do. That's what a priest does. He offers sacrifice. Can I just interrupt you there for a second, Tom? Certainly, certainly. Uh, you were using the word oblation, of course, yeah? There's yep. no more oblation. Now, yeah. the point is, uh, what you see here, this is a wafer, as you know, in the English, okay? That mm -hmm. is what they are offering in the uh, Roman Catholic Church during the Mass as, a, uh, as an oblation, right? This is called in German oblate, oblate, mm -hmm. yeah? Yeah. So mm -hmm. this is actually the word oblate, host, uh, the host, as we said in English, or the, um, the wafer, the German word is oblate, from oblation. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is so in your face that when you see that, yeah. that they are using what Christ surely did away with, And even in, 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 in words like in, in, in German, in, in languages like German, they still use 
a derivative of that word oblation, oblate, mm -hmm. for the wafer. Yeah, it's a meal offering. Yeah, it's a meal offering. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, when, no when I go to this article and put it in English, it says the wafer is a crisp, often yeah. sweetie, very thin, flat, light, dry cookie. Yeah, as we said, yeah. the Jesus cookie. But yep. when you when you take it in German, it speaks of oblate, which is oblation. And this is yeah. uh, incredible, I think, how even the language uh, that uh, people are using um, gives away the iniquities of the Roman Catholic Church in this regard. Yeah, I, I thank you for pointing this out, because that's a point that I rarely make. But uh, literally, the wafer that the, the Roman Catholic priests offer is the equivalent of a meal offering that the Jews made. And uh, even calls it an oblate in the, in the, in the German language. It's uh, a, a perfectly appropriate demonstration of what Daniel meant when he said he caused the sacrifices, which was normally an animal sacrifice, and oblations, which was a meal offering, to cease. So that covers the Jew and the Roman Catholic, doesn't it? The Jew offers the, the animal sacrifice and a meal offering. The Roman Catholic Church offers what they call a bloodless sacrifice, which can never take away sin, obviously. There's no remission of sin without the shedding of blood. And uh, this meal offering, see? And uh, it... Uh, the precise language, one would think, is uh, extremely coincidental, but there's no coincidence at all. It's exactly what God intended to uh, communicate. When people no think more, that they can understand. No, no more sacrifices as the Jews made, and no more oblations as the Roman Catholics have made for 1,500 years or however long they've done it. And I think also there interesting... Is, yeah. There is no more sacrifice for sin. No. It's over. And and this is why I say when, when they make sacrifice, they eat and drink damnation to themselves. I think what also is interesting, Tom, when you have a look at this wafer, you see um, uh, the corn in there. The, uh, yeah. Uh, what is it? The cereal. Yeah? Cereal. Yeah. And the word cereal comes from the goddess Ceres which is another form of the Queen of Heaven. Mm -hmm. So this actually is an offering for the Queen of Heaven. Of course, this oblate, this wafer, is called Marienbader oblate. It means Mary Bader oblate. Mary, Queen of Heaven. Ceres, yeah. cereal. You have it all there. <laughs> you just have yeah. to read the signs. It's yeah. incredible how, how in the open, actually, this betrayal is and people don't see it. Yeah, it's, it's, it's incredible in many people's minds just how specific the Bible is in its language when they finally realize the truth. Uh, it's, it's literally uncanny. Uh, there's two uh, that still offer sacrifices, Jews and, and Roman Catholics. And the very language that they use to describe their sacrifices is used by Daniel in his prophecy. In chapter 9, verse 24 through 27, sacrifices and oblations, meat offerings and meal offerings, they're both covered. So uh, even though the Roman Catholic Church does not make a meat offering, it does make a meal offering. A man-made uh, wafer uh, made out of wheat and salt, and uh, it's made normally by the nuns, by the hands of the nuns. It's a, it's a man-made sacrifice and uh, so uh, they offer the works of their hands just like Cain did in in the Garden of Eden remember Abel offered a spotless lamb according to God's law and he shed its blood that's why Abel's sins were remitted and Cain offered the grain the work the the, the grain of his field the works of his hands and his sacrifice was rejected. Salvation so, uh, by works, that was. That's, that's right. He made his own, uh, his own uh, sacrifice after his own fashion. 
and not specifically according to uh, the requirements of God for the remission of sin. It's just as much as saying, I'll have my salvation and I'll do it my way. Well, man can't uh, pay for his own sin. And uh, to, to, to do it my way means I don't need Christ. And Christ is our only hope. And uh, that's why this, his sins were not remitted. And, uh, and out of rage, he killed his, his righteous brother Abel. And isn't it strange that all of history records the bloody killing of God's blood-washed people by the Roman Catholic Church's inquisitions and crusades and a killing that still goes on today unabated, and uh, now it's called world wars, okay? That might be beyond the scope of our discussion, but it's never mentioned because it's not comprehended in the Christian world. But the papacy is in much control of the kings of the earth and the militaries of the earth as he was during the Dark Ages. And when there's a global war, when there's a regional war, when there's a local war, the papacy is involved, and it's all for his purpose. And uh, so uh, the bloodshed still continues today. Okay, let's continue then in the reading of the text of Hebrews chapter 10. It says in verse 19, Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus by a new and living way which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh, and having an high priest over the house of God. Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us mm-hmm. hold fast. You want to, you want to comment that, Tom? No, it's just it's just marvelous what is accomplished by the sacrifice of Christ in the midst of the of the week, the seventieth and final week of Daniel's prophecy. What Jesus literally accomplished for us on the cross is what it, what we're reading about here. Yeah, something we could never have accomplished by ourselves. Never. Right. Uh. Uh-uh. No. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as ye see the day approaching. For if we sin willfully after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. In other words, if we sin willfully after we've received the knowledge of the truth, that Jesus' blood washed away our sins, and we are now under a blood covenant which we cannot break, okay, because it's a one-sided covenant, Uh, there remains no more sacrifice for sin. It's not going to do you any good to say, well, I've broken the blood covenant with Jesus, because you can't break it. You didn't shed the blood. He did. Okay? And then then to say that we've we've sinned beyond Christ's blood to uh, cleanse us of our sins, let us make us another sacrifice another lamb, another goat, another meal offering, okay? There's no such thing. Your salvation and remission is in the blood of Christ and it alone, okay? So whether we sin willfully or ignorantly, knowingly or unknowingly, Christ is the only sacrifice that takes away sin. It's not going to do you any good to go back to the old system of animal sacrifices and oblations. Okay? This is just another way to express 
what Daniel originally expressed, that in the midst of the week he would cause the sacrifices and oblations to cease. <clears throat> no more sacrifices. So whether you live a sinless life from the time of your salvation, which is highly unlikely in my estimation. <laughs> yeah, we try. <laughs> we try. And I, I, I tell you, Tom, everybody who says of himself, where well, I live without sin is a liar. Oh, absolutely. A liar. Absolutely. I, I mean, in verse 26, it says, if we sin willfully, and even that happens, even for a reborn Christian. Sure. Uh, you know, we, we, we try to avoid sin, of course, I know, because it is against our new nature. It's yeah, against It is our against nature. our new God character. Is, yeah, God has written his law in our hearts. Yeah, and we would go against that what is written in our hearts, but still sometimes we do that. I, I, I think nobody can ever speak himself completely free of it. But the wonderful thing is that then we still have Christ if we uh, humble ourselves and be meek and go on our knees back to Jesus Christ. He will forgive us for that. But Paul only said, he will forgive us for it, and there's no other forgiveness. I am the way, the truth, and the life, and nobody comes to the Father but by me, Jesus Christ said. And this is so important to understand. Of course it can happen that we sin willfully. Otherwise, uh, Luke or whoever wrote the book of Hebrews, um, because I don't think that was written by Paul, if I remember correctly, yeah. uh, it, uh, I think it is attributed to, to Luke, uh, who wrote the Gospel of Luke, of course, who, who wrote this, uh, even he says, for if we sin willfully, that means we sin willfully, because we are still in the corrupted flesh here. Right. And there's nothing we can do about it. We strive not to sin, we strive to be perfect, but we cannot be perfect as long as we are in this sinful, damnable, fleshly, corrupted material body. Yes. Sin is an exception rather than the rule in the state of salvation. And this is why uh, and this is why Paul said if we sin, we have an advocate with the Father. Yeah, right. And he said if we sin, we confess our sins and he God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Okay? So, so the blood of Christ is a gift that keeps on giving as long as we, as long as we're in this sinful robe of flesh, that is that is prone to sin, that is against us, against our conscience all the time. We wrestle with this sinful flesh. Its nature is to sin and to satisfy its wants and desires, which are not holy. And, uh, yeah, even Paul said that, uh, Tom, uh, and I think you know sure. this verse better by heart than I do, when he says, uh, the things that I hate, I do, and the things that I uh, I, I, I want to do, I, uh, I I can't, or something like that. Yes, he says that that which I would do, I do not, and that which I would not, I, that I do, he said. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, so uh, uh, those going around with pious looks and say that they've uh, conquered sin in their lives, I just nod patiently and walk along. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's just, uh, just sometimes, uh, you know, we become so holy as to render Christ's blood unnecessary, which is absolutely ludicrous. But uh, it's it, if you try to argue with someone like that, they'll just go to the greater lengths to, t to describe to you how perfect and sinless they are and, and uh, embarrass themselves even more, so I just leave them alone. Mm. Yeah. It remembers of that um, encounter that Jesus had with this one guy who said, I have uh, never sinned in my life. <laughs> yeah, that was the rich young ruler. The rich, rich and, young ruler. Uh, and of course, he was, sp he was speaking to the only flesh and blood man in the history of the universe that never sinned, and that was Jesus. And what he was literally doing, whether he knew it or not, he was literally telling Jesus that he was the Messiah. And Jesus plainly said, okay, if that's true, uh, then give up all that you have and follow me. Like Jesus did, right? Give right. up all that he had in heaven, even his throne, and follow Christ. And that's when the rich young ruler had to walk away. Why? Because he wasn't the Messiah. 
few people really comprehend what that story is all about. The story of the rich young ruler. It's never preached this way in the pulpits of the churches, but it's the only thing that makes sense. When the rich young ruler said that he'd kept God's law perfectly all of his life, Jesus said, okay, Mr. Righteous, now sell all that you have or give it to the poor and follow me. And uh, he couldn't do that. Only Messiah could give up everything to redeem mankind. And he did. And thank God he did. Or we would be without hope. So, anybody who claims to be sinless is essentially claiming to be Messiah because the Bible plainly says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That is a fact. There's no exception to that rule. There's only one flesh and blood man that ever lived that did not sin, who never sinned, and that was Messiah the Prince. And to claim that you're sinless is to claim that you are the Messiah the Prince that Daniel prophesied. It's blasphemy to say that you're sinless. Okay? Our sins are washed away in the blood of Christ because we've all sinned and we're all in need of saving. And it's only Christ's blood that washes away our sins. And we had nothing to do with it. Jesus did it alone, unassisted, without our help, without our input. And uh, that's why salvation is eternal. And that's exactly why if we sin, if we knowingly sin after we have believed, there is no more sacrifice for sin. Only Jesus and his blood. The self-same sacrifice that forgives all our sins continues to wash away our sins. And if we sin... We have an advocate with the Father, Christ Jesus the righteous, the and, Son and, of God. And him alone, Tom. And him uh, alone. Let that's us it. Let, let us let us go a little bit deeper into that subject because I think that is a very interesting discussion that could develop here. The Roman Catholic Church claims that the Virgin Mary was born without sin. When the Bible clearly states, as you said, there's only one man who ever lived on this earth, who walked this earth, who was born in this earth without sin, and that's Jesus Christ. The Roman Catholic Church teaches, she teaches, and it's her dogma. It is of the um, immaculate conception of Mary, that Mary was born without, quote-unquote, original sin. Original sin, again, is a... a uh, <laughs> a false uh, Babylonian, a false Roman teaching. But she makes, the Roman Catholic Church makes Mary Christ-like. She makes Mary a second Christ, where there is only one. And I think that is a very deep deception we maybe want to go into a little bit, Tom when we say there remains no more sacrifice for sins but Jesus Christ alone, who was the only one who ever lived on this earth without uh, without spot and uh, without blemish, without sin. Only Jesus Christ was not Mary. And I think the deception the Roman Catholic Church puts on there with this Mary teaching is just outrageous. You want to go into that a little bit? Well, it's designed to be outrageous because it's the synagogue of Satan. It's not a Christian church. It's not to be equated with Christianity at all. That, that's why uh, everyone throughout history who realized what the Roman Catholic Church was, the synagogue of Satan, and said so, were killed. That's the blood of the saints and the martyrs of Jesus all throughout the Christian era. That's why the bloodshed continues today, is to point out the counterfeit Christianity, uh, which could hardly even be called counterfeit. 
to say that Mary was born and made immaculate and that her immaculate sinless condition was passed on to Jesus, that makes us dependent upon Mary for salvation. And that's what the Roman Catholic Church is all about, nullifying Christ. That's why it's called the Antichrist Church. And uh, this is why all Bible-believing Christians throughout history have identified the Roman Catholic Church as the counter-church, the Antichrist Church, the synagogue of Satan. Okay? It, it's the Gentile equivalent of that church that existed in Christ's day that sought to kill him. Okay? They wanted their sacrifices and oblations to cover their sins. And uh, God was doing away with that system. He put his son on this earth to bleed and die for our redemption. Complete and total redemption. And then never to have to die again. And, uh, but the but the but the Jews rejected that and wished to return to animal sacrifices, just like the Roman Catholic Church does. Only they say it's to kill Christ over and over and over and over every day on the altars of the Roman Catholic Church, and it's a salvific issue. Uh, and and they call Mary the fountain of grace. It's. Uh, it's perfectly identifiable as the synagogue of Satan once one begins to be taught and learn the errors of the Roman Catholic Church. But it's considered uh, antisocial, it's considered controversial, it's considered hate speech, uh, and every other error to point out uh, this antichrist dogma of the Roman Catholic Church and how it opposes Christ in every aspect. It was as if Satan created a mastermind of counterfeit Christianity to oppose Christ on every count. That's what the Roman Catholic Church is assembled to do. That's what it has done throughout the entire Christian era, and that's why it seeks to destroy God's people throughout the entire Christian era. We're not talking about one single man that, that doesn't come to the earth until just three and a half or seven years before Christ returned to kill the saints, to become drunk with the, the blood of the saints and the martyrs of Jesus. That's not going to happen. Okay, We're talking about an ages-old foe of Christ, the papacy, which grew up in the power vacuum left by the restrainer, when he was taken out of the way and left Rome and took up his residence in Constantinople, the Caesars of the Roman Empire. Then the papacy became the, the Caesar, the papal Caesar, okay? And uh, he's been persecuting God's people ever since. Look, the, the truth of, of the Bible, the truth of history, as we have it in the Bible, makes far, far more sense than the ridiculous uh, fables taught in all the churches today about the Antichrist. And the reason people walk the streets in a daze and can't figure out what in the world is going on in this world is simply because they don't know who the Antichrist is and they don't know who he's in bed with. And sadly to say, he's in bed with all the kings of the earth and all the pastors that preach the futurist lies and direct us to a false antichrist. The reason we don't know who to pray against is because we don't know Christ's enemy in this world. Satan has put upon the throne of the world the antichrist, the papacy, which reigneth over the kings of the earth in that city, that great city, that sits on seven hills in Rome. And this isn't new. This is what has been believed by Christians throughout the entire Christian era. It's only new to us because we're hearing it for the first time. But you have to ask yourself, why are we now just hearing this for the first time? Because they're trying to deceive us. 
They have deceived us. I call it the greatest deception since the Garden of Eden. To hide from us the true identity of the man of sin, the son of perdition, the biblical, historical, and prophetic Antichrist, the one who has reigned over the kings of the earth for 15 to 1800 years. Depending on when you want to mark the start of the papacy, that's the start of the reign and the rule of Antichrist in this world. The papacy is, was, and always will be until Christ returns, the Antichrist. And he's going to continue in his prophetic role until Christ returns. And we ought to pray against him. We ought to preach against him. We ought to identify all of his lying wonders, all of his false doctrines, and, mar and, and mark him Ichabod. Okay? Mark him as the man of sin. And stand fast on that belief, even if it causes us to, to uh, be killed. All right? That's how important it is. Jesus is the Christ, the papacy is the Antichrist. That's the way it's always been for God's people in the Christian era. They're waiting for the man of sin to come in the future as if he doesn't exist. That's the delusion that is taught from the pulpits of all the churches in this country and around the world. That we don't have to, the, 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 the Antichrist is no factor. The Antichrist is no threat. The Antichrist is not here yet. That is the deception. Okay? And now, since they have us all believing this, what could be their objective? Well, to have a future fulfillment of the 70th week of Daniel in the modern nation state of Israel with Jews living in the land, building a temple and a priesthood, beginning animal sacrifices again, and then making a treaty, a covenant with many for one week in the midst of the week to break that treaty and cause the sacrifices and oblations to cease. You know, can you tell me now already what, what's the purpose of all this? To bring in a false messiah. That's what it's all about. That's what it's all about. All they have to have is a false messiah to sign a, a false seven-year peace treaty with the Jews and then break that treaty after three and a half years in the midst of the 70th week, they call it, and cause the sacrifices and oblations to cease and then possibly stand up in this new modern Jewish temple and proclaim himself to be God or set up some kind of a statue or something and command the whole world to worship it, you won't be able to convince one single futurist Christian that that is not the Antichrist. It's all a charade. Because to them, it's a fulfillment of Bible prophecy. So once this Antichrist is done away with, somehow taken out of the way, and the whole world believes that the Antichrist is now gone, What's the only thing left to do? To receive Christ. And just as the papacy creates this Antichrist figure to sign a peace treaty, the Antichrist will create another Savior. And I believe it'll be the last Pope. And the whole Christian world will receive him. And Jesus even predicted it. He said, I came in my Father's name, and you received me not. But there's one who comes after me who will come in his own name, and him you will receive. And no, uh, contrary to what all the experts and the theologians and the doctors of divinity tell you, it was not Bar Kokhba. It's the Antichrist Jesus was speaking of. There's one coming after me who will come in his own name. That is one the Father did not give him. He will come in his own name, and him you will receive. Have the Jews received their Messiah yet? No. 
So who do you suppose that would be? It's the papacy, the author of the greatest delusion since the Garden of Eden. It's called futurism. It's been preached from the pulpits of the churches in this country for nigh unto 200 years. And now it is believed by every, by every so-called Christian church. It is believed by every denomination. It is preached in one form or fashion by, behind every pulpit of every church, not only in this country, but around the world. The whole world is deluded. They believe a lie, even the very elect. And who do we have to blame? Number one, ourselves. For allowing ourselves to be deceived. But the blame belongs to the pastors and the priesters, the seminarians that don't read and study the scriptures for themselves. They just believe and teach whatever they've been told. And they get their learning from Jesuit pro professors in the Protestant and evangelical seminaries. They were long ago infiltrated by the Jesuit order, a Jesuit order that has sworn to destroy Protestantism from the face of the earth. And that's how they decided to do it. And it worked. Or has it? That's up to us. Back to you, York. Yeah, it still works, Tom. It hasn't stopped working. They are continuing their agenda all the way along. And uh, the only thing we can do about it is a very easy solution, I'd say. And uh, that is just to pick up this book and read our Bible. Read the only truth that uh, God has provided for mankind in this world. I mean, there are some very good authors also. Uh, like Henry Gretton Guinness, James Atkin Wiley, and... Uh, uh, True Protestant reformers, the list is endless. It's John hard on Fox, the and, yeah, and, and so many, so many you, could, you could name, but, you know, the, the point is the only truth is uh, without spot and blemish to be found in the Bible. And we should right. read our Bible. This is why we are going through Hebrews 10 to show to you that in this book, in Hebrews chapter 10, for example, also in other places, and we are going into those later on, the truth is recorded. It is recorded that Jesus was and Jesus is the Christ, that Jesus was and Jesus is the Messiah, that Jesus right. was and is the only fulfillment of the prophecies of the Old Testament. And I'm not speaking of Daniel chapter 9 explicitly. Daniel chapter 9 is only giving us the perfect time of his coming. That's and right. the points that he's doing. But there are other chapters, other prophecies of Jesus Christ. So many, like for example, Isaiah 53, the quote-unquote forbidden chapter or forgotten chapter. Yeah, the forgotten chapter, I think it's called. Um, so many prophecies about Jesus Christ have been made. He is the only fulfillment. And the book that he actually gave to us, the Bible, or he gives to us, still gives to us, the Bible, if you use an uncorrupted, correct Bible, preferably in English, the 1611 authorized version of the King James Bible, when you read that, you have a perfect record of exactly that. And you will not be easily deceived. I, I don't say that you won't be deceived, but you won't be deceived as easily as all of mankind is. Right, Certainly, Tom? counterfeit Bibles played a large hand in, a, in enabling people to believe in the futurist deception, this carefully devised fable that the 70th week of Daniel is yet future. That uh, is only possible through corrupted Bibles and corrupted pastors. And the Jesuits have worked overtime. In the Dark Ages, they forbid people to read the Scriptures. And when the printing press and the popularity of the scriptures became such that they could no longer forbid people to read it, they corrupted it. So it, so, so the truth was destroyed in it. And uh, so it is absolutely critical to get the right Bible. 
to get the truth. And uh, a Jesuit corrupt, corrupted Bible is strategically corrupted to force you to believe a lie and uh, to justify lies and fables to being preached from, from the pulpits of your churches. So uh, we, we don't want to believe liars. Look, these, these new Bibles can't even agree with themselves, let alone to agree agree with the with the uh, with the authorized King James Bible it, it's obvious which Bibles are counterfeit those Bibles that can't interpret themselves they are the counterfeit Bibles the authorized King James Bible interprets itself you have no need for an interpreter that's how you tell an authentic word of God from a counterfeit word of God when a child is telling the truth, he tells the truth every time, the same way. When a lying child tells the story, it changes every time he tells it. That's how we distinguish the true Bible from the counterfeit. And uh, the counterfeit Bibles don't agree with themselves. They don't agree with one another. And uh, it shouldn't deceive anybody. But we use every kind of excuse to, to justify reading a counterfeit Bible. Well, it's easier to read. Well, uh, they, they do away with the these and the thous and, and, and all this nonsense. Absolutely nonsense. So uh, get yourself an authorized King James 1611 version of the Bible and read and know that you're getting the truth from Almighty God. He is powerful to preserve his own word not to lead us astray. And uh, how could we be held uh, accountable for the Scriptures if the Scriptures, the authentic Scriptures, no longer exist? God is able and powerful to not only create the universe and everything that's in it, and then to provide for our salvation perfectly and completely, but also to make sure that we have the unadulterated truth. So, uh, you know, the idea that God is able to preserve his word is lost. People don't, don't even comprehend that anymore. But what's because we've never been told that Satan is intently attempting to destroy, to counterfeit, and to corrupt the Bible. I mean, after all, we've seen example after example after example how the papacy is a counterfeit Christ in the world. Satan is working overtime to counterfeit everything God has. Certainly, we have to understand that Satan has been successful in counterfeiting God's word. You could just name them all, but it would take a half an hour to name all the false Bibles in the world. And interesting, Tom, since I'm German, when I read... Um in German, Daniel chapter 9, verses 24 through 27, for the very first time, I think that was in the Luther Bible of 1984, which is a very much corrupted Bible, by the way. Uh, then I read it in the Luther of 1545, which is also not a very correct Bible altogether. Uh, every German Bible that I read, Daniel chapter 9, verses 24 through 27, up to now, I couldn't even understand it. And German is my main my mother language yeah my uh, my mother tongue as they say yeah, yeah? Mm -hmm. and i cannot understand that written in there so i made a few videos where i translated daniel chapter 9 verses 24 through 27 into german called them the greatest deception since the garden of eden in german and i provided the correct text to, uh, translated from the 1611 King James Bible, and now all of a sudden it's for the very first time it makes sense. Mm -hmm. And there's another example that we could talk about in, in this regard. Of course, you don't know that because you don't speak German, but you have to take my word for it. Uh, Isaiah chapter 14. Isaiah chapter 14 is famous for uh, pointing out Lucifer's rebellion in heaven. Uh, How art thy fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? 
And the corrupted King James Bible even uses an exclamation mark after that sentence, where there needs to be a question mark, because, you know, that's a question. Mm -hmm. um, the point is, in the English version, after that, it says five times I. I mm -hmm. will exalt myself above the, uh, above the clouds of heaven. I will also sit in the mount of the congregation. I will do this. I will do that. I don't know it by heart, but that's no problem. I always have a Bible here. If I need to read it exactly, I open my Bible and I read it. But the point is, these five eyes are very important because with that you have an explanation of the pentagram, of the five-pointed star that is used all in the world. Just look at your American flag and the stars. There are five-pointed stars, a pentagram. And that has to do with the five eyes of the rebellion of Lucifer in heaven. But you don't have these five eyes in German. You only have two eyes. And then they yes. put the sentence in a completely different way that you never get the same understanding in German as you can get from the English version. Yeah. And that's just incredible. Mm -hmm. So when you have the English version and you put the, the German version next to it and you are able to speak both tongues, you can compare and then you are left with a question mark, which Bible shall I believe now? And you, as an English-speaking um, man or woman, should do the same. Take out the 1611 authorized version of the King James and put the other Bible that you were maybe used to read next to it and compare. Yeah. And then you will see that all of a sudden you will get a much better understanding when you use the correct Bible instead of the false Bible. And I can really... Uh, make that point with assertion because I speak those two languages and I see how betrayed my German brethren are. When I taught to them these five eyes of, uh, of Isaiah chapter 14 for the first time, many people say, well, what is he saying now? I don't understand. But now many things, of course, make sense. But in German Bibles, you will not find it that way. So that's, well, that how, important, that's how, how important it is to have a correct Bible. Certainly. And uh, another thing that struck me as I began to learn all these things was that Isaiah chapter 14 not only uh, describes Satan to a T, but if you use that same passage and compare it with what we know about the papacy and its history, it also describes the papacy. Absolutely. And uh, when this is why uh, many people might not understand when, when I speak of the papacy, I speak of him not as the vicar of Christ, which is his official title, but in reality, in truth, he is the vicar of Satan. And as a matter of fact, Martin Luther and many of the Protestant reformers uh, likened the papacy to to Satan hidden behind a robe of flesh. That's how they describe the papacy. Satan himself hidden behind a veil of flesh. And invariably in their writings, eventually they'll bring up uh, Isaiah chapter 14 and point out how it is actually describing not just Lucifer, not just Satan, but the papacy itself, the 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 identity is uh, unimpeachable. Okay, we have a counterfeit Christ, a representative of Satan in the world, and that man is the man of sin in Rome. And uh, so, so these things have been long established. This is this only sounds new to people who have been taught and believe futurism all their lives. That, that, that belief that says that the Antichrist isn't here yet. He comes just before Christ returns. If you believe that, you can hardly believe what we're telling you, except that what we're telling you makes far, far more sense, and it also uh, shakes hands with history. Makes, for the first time in our lives, it makes history make sense. And... Uh, but what is so remarkable, if you will just take the time and begin to read the writings 
of the Protestant reformers and the Protestants throughout history, the Protestants that preached Christ long before the Protestant Reformation, you'll find out they all believe the same thing. They believe what Yerk and I and uh, others are, have, ta have taught and are teaching today. And, uh, and, of course, it falls on deaf ears because futurism is so ingrained in the Christian uh, world today as to be almost impossible. I mean, they've been imprinted with futurism. And uh, all of these false hopes of futurism, when the reality makes far more sense and is so uh, consistent with history as to be literally unimpeachable. And futurism all of a sudden appears to be a childish fabrication, not even a respectable fabrication. It's childish in its nature. It is so imbecilic as to be embarrassing. Now, I'm not looking down my long nose at anyone. I believe this nonsense, this futurist nonsense for 50 years of my life. I was preached. I was preached it by pastors and teachers and aunts and uncles and parents and cousins and my closest, dearest family all my life. And now to preach something otherwise, the truth, makes me an enemy of all those people. Am I become your enemy because I tell you the truth, Tom? That's the truth. You, you, when you attempt to tell the truth in this world, you have no friends, you have no family, and you've got to be satisfied to stand alone with the truth. You, if, you, if your life depends on fellowship, you better stay away from the truth. Oh, yeah. That's, when, that's right. If, if your life and your satisfaction and your happiness in this world is determined by other people, you better stay away from historicism. Because you're going to be disappointed. You're going to stand alone. You're going to be lonely. You're going to be acquainted with loneliness. You better be happy with the fellowship of Christ, because that's all the fellowship you're going to have. And if you're fortunate enough and blessed enough to find another human being that's willing to embrace the truth at all cost, hang on to him like a brother. Back to you, Yerk. Well, Tom, thank you very much for your explanation. I just want to make two more points uh, to the end of the video here um, that we can go through. Um, one point is uh, compare now what you have, uh, what you see on the screen right now. This is the AV 1611 King James Bible, uh, means the authorized version yeah, of 1611 with the original text that you mm -hmm. can see, of course, in the old writing with the U instead of the V. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Isaiah chapter 14, verse 12. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? Question mark. How yep. art thou cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? Question mark. And this is the standard KJV, which probably 95% of the people use and think that they have the correct version, which is the corrupted 1769 Blaney version of the King James Bible, where it says, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer? I'm not speaking about the difference that it uses a V instead of a U. Son of the morning, how art thou cut down to the ground which didst weaken the nations? But I speak of the exclamation mark instead of the question mark. Why in the world would you change 180 years after, or 160 years, sorry, after the, uh, after the first bringing out of the King James Version, the sentence which is clearly in its form as it is written a question, and use it as an exclamation that gives a wrong understanding to many people, and that is something that you have to be that, that you have to understand. Yeah, why would they do that? This is why Tom and I always make the point: if you use a King James Bible, then make sure that you use the 1611 authorized version. Yeah, there is another problem with this version. Uh, 
the, the correct version on the internet, and that is that the words in italic, which are added to the original texts, are not in italics on the online version. You will only find that in the printed version. So, therefore, you always need to have a printed version with you. But that is just another point that I'm going to make. I think this is very clear. We see it right here on the screen. Exclamation mark two times. And in the original, it is a question mark two times. And another point that I want to make, uh, Tom, that is, um, let's go there uh, just a second. Well, well, before we go, let, let me more perfectly understand, uh, describe why it's essential to have the 1611 in the case of the punctuation marks. If, if, the, if, the, if, the, if the first verse ends in question marks, that's indicating to us that God is a asking a question. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nation? Question mark. There's two questions answered, or asked, and that demands an answer. Exactly. And the answer comes in verse 13. For, or because, thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God, I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds, I will be like the most high. Okay? That's why Lucifer was cast out of heaven and was cast down to the ground because he thought to have God's throne. He thought to exalt himself above God himself. That's why he was cast out. Now, if you take the question mark away and just leave the exclamation points in there, there's no question asked and there's no answer to be sought in verse 13. And it just appears to be a narrative that we can neither learn anything from or impart knowledge to anyone else. That's what Satan accomplished by taking the question mark out and putting the exclamation points in. It changes our understanding. And uh, we are to realize that verse 12 asks two questions. And verse 13 and 14 answer those questions. So now we know the controversy that existed that got Lucifer cast out of heaven. That he sought to exalt himself above the stars of God. Okay? So that leaves us open the possibility that what Lucifer's vicar on earth does the papacy when he is sought when he asserts to exalt his throne above the stars of the uh, of heaven to exalt his throne above the stars of god to sit upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north and ascend above the heights of the clouds and be like the most high and rule over the kings of the earth as king of kings and lord of lords there's nothing wrong with that that leads us to Second Thessalonians chapter 2, Tom. That's exactly the last point that I wanted to make. Because yeah. here it says, um, uh, in Second Thessalonians 2, uh, that uh, the Antichrist will sit in the temple of God, who opposes and exalteth himself here in verse 4, right? Mm -hmm. Who opposes... Yes. Oh, sorry. Uh, let me just put that in color here. Who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God. Compare this now to what Tom just read in chapter thir uh, verse 13 mm -hmm. and 14 of Isaiah 12. Uh, 14, sorry. <laughs> um, or that is worshipped so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. This 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 4, is in other words a repetition of Isaiah chapter 14, verse 13 and right. 14. And that is the understanding that you have to gain. This is the Bible explaining itself. There is no other way, there is no future Antichrist to fulfill all these things written in Isaiah in the first place and in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 in the other place. This is how you have to study the Bible, and this is how the Bible completely explains itself and 
uh, gives you the assurance that it is the only true preserved word of God in our time that we have today. Please, Tom, in, in, uh, final in the, remark. In, in the corrupted Bible, it reads as though uh, the answer to the question, verse 13, is, is nothing but a continuation of a narrative and that there is no crime involved is the same logic that is used uh, when the papacy describes itself as the king of the earth and expects every man, woman, and child to obey him as if he were Christ on earth, and that there's nothing wrong with that. That's the way to worship Christ, according to the papacy, to obey Christ's vicar on the earth. All right? But, but if you have an authorized King James Version, and verse 12 in Isaiah 14 is posed as a question, and then for verse 13 is instinctively interpreted or is, is acknowledged and recognized as the answer to those questions. It's simply telling us this is why Lucifer was kicked out of heaven. This is the way to oppose God, to attempt to take over his throne. Okay, well, likewise, if we understand that when we read how the papacy describes itself, in, in, in verse 4 here, then we understand that is what got Lucifer kicked out of heaven, and that's what's going to get the man of sin destroyed when Christ returns. And that mankind is not to obey him as if he were Christ on earth. So see the, see the importance, see the consequences of virtually just changing a question mark to an exclamation point. The papacy literally expects every man, woman, and child to lovingly and and uh, and uh, loyally acknowledging the papacy as Christ's replacement on the earth and worship him as though he were Christ and to have the power to to claim the power to himself to put to death anyone who will not bend the knee and bow and worship him. He's counterfeiting Christ. But if you leave the question mark in verse 14, then it becomes a question, and verse 13 and 14 become the answer, and we can, t we can distinguish what is right and what is wrong. And uh, no one uh, replaces Christ except the Holy Spirit himself. Jesus said, I must go away, for if I go not away, the Comforter will not come. But if I go away, the Comforter will come, and he will teach you all things. The vicar of Christ was assigned directly and specifically by Jesus Christ himself. The replacement of the Son of God is called in the Scripture the Holy Spirit. And the papacy, who claims to be the vicar or replacement of Christ on earth, has blasphemed the Holy Spirit in taking upon himself that title. So, is there any better answer to the question? And teaching, who is that, the, and teaching Tom, that the uh, replacement of Christ is a man, quote-unquote yeah. Peter, as they teach, uh, yeah. Because they say that Peter was in Rome and Peter was the first pope, which are all lies, and we have dealt with that in other broadcasts, uh, you and I apart, and I think also here and there together a little bit. Um, but that is easy for anyone, uh, for anyone who reads the Bible to understand completely that Peter never was in Rome. So when Jesus said, there will be a replacement of myself in the Spirit, the Antichrist says, no, there's a replacement for Jesus Christ in the flesh. Yep. And that's the biggest joke of them all. And then again, you see the counterfeit teaching of the Roman Catholic Church. It just turns around 180 degrees everything that the Bible says. When the Bible says the substitute of Christ here on earth will be the Holy Spirit, announced by Jesus Christ himself, the Roman Catholic Church twists the Bible and says, no, the replacement of Christ here on earth is Peter and his succession of quote-unquote apostolic succession. Isn't that a nice way to end this broadcast today, Tom, and to think about that again the Roman Catholic Church turns around Bible, biblical teaching 180 degrees. The Bible says 
it will be a spirit. Man says, it will be a man. Exalting himself above all that is called God. Right? Yep, that's right. Couldn't have said it better. You know, who is a blasphemer of the Holy Spirit? One who says that he has replaced Christ. And there's only one on earth. There's only ever been one on earth. That's the papacy. You can't get it wrong, folks. See how ridiculous it is to believe in a future Antichrist? And what is most remarkable, like I've said before, none of this is new. All these things we've talked about today on this broadcast have been talked about for centuries, for millennia among God's people. They have written about it. Their sermons are still extant. It's only our generation that's deceived. My suggestion is we all, we all get and study and read the writings and teachings of the Protestant reformers and even those who existed long before the Protestant Reformation. God's people have always protested the man of sin in Rome. The Protestant Reformation of 1517 only marked a grand exodus of Roman Catholics out of the Roman Catholic Church coming to the Protestant truth that has existed since the days of Paul and the Thessalonians. They knew who the Antichrist was. They, we know who the Antichrist is and who he will always be. The man of sin, the self-styled, Vicar of Christ, the global blasphemer of Almighty God and the Holy Spirit. That's the papacy. The description fits no one else ever in the history of the world. You can't get it wrong. That's how God wants us to be secure in our knowledge. We can't get it wrong. <laughs> His name together, oh, magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt His name together. Let's magnify the Lord so that He is seen more clearly. Psalm 34, verse 3. Let's exalt His name to Exalt His name together And let us exalt His name